So very uh, warm good evening to all present here. Uh, respected um, uh, speaker for the day, Dr. Alok Nath Day, the chair elect 2022 for the IEEE Bangalore section. Uh, also in the absence of our chair of IEEE Bangalore section, Dr. Deepa Shanoi, madam, uh, and all the members of the committee, uh, I welcome you all to this curtain raiser webinar. So, uh, I would like to briefly introduce you to what is this uh, webinar about. So, the IEEE Bangalore Humanitarian Technology Conclave, which is uh, very popularly known as BHTC, uh, is hosting its flagship event every year. And this year, too, the BHTC 2022 will be held, uh, um, which is a part of the humanitarian outreach program of the section where technology leaders, innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders uh, share their passion for addressing impactful solutions and pressing problems and share a vision on futuristic technologies that will may disrupt or impact our lives. And uh, the way we work and are living. Now, the second edition of the IEEE BHTC is scheduled on the October 1st and 2nd, 2022, at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, NIAS, and is based on the theme of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 12, which is sustainable consumption and resumption to ensure the efficient use of resources and energy and to create sustainable infrastructure and provide access to basic services and ensuring a better quality of life for all. So the IEEE Bangalore section and the Education Activity Committee and the Organizing Committee of the BHTC 2022 cordially invite you all to participate in the curtain raiser on SDG 12, uh, which is the Sustainable Consumption and Production. This is a special webinar uh, the speaker is Dr. Alok Nadde, the chair-elect of 2022 IEEE Bangalore section. Uh, this will basically help you understand uh, the SDG goal uh, 12 uh, and enable the student participants uh, to participate um, in a more focused and a better understanding about the project that they could uh, represent or you know, demonstrate as a part of the competition for poster and project presentation at the BHTC 2022, uh, which will be held on the October 1st and 2nd. So that's the aim of this special webinar. And uh, at the same time, uh, those of you who could not uh, make it, uh, but due to some constraints, we will be sharing the recording of this meeting, uh, uh, which will also be useful uh, to the ones who could not make it for the webinar. And I thank uh, Dr. Alok Nath Desa for accepting the uh, res you know, opportunity and responsibility to uh, speak more about SDG 12 uh, and make uh, all other you know listeners understand about uh, the impact that this uh, SDG will create uh, for a living and uh, working environment. So uh, I uh, now put it over to Alok sir to take over from here. Uh, so welcome, sir. Uh, it's on. Thank you. Now. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Vindu, for introducing me at the same time setting the stage why we are here this afternoon and next 40 45 minutes i'll be talking about it and interacting with you and also our chair dr deepa shanai ma'am i know uh, she couldn't make it but she's very passionate about this topic and sharing uh, to take this forward as you said on 1st and 2nd october bhtc uh, so this is a carton raiser webinar for introducing the topic as you can see the topic, this is SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. So I will do in four segments. First to introduce what are the sustainable development goals and why uh, people have come this far. What is the need, what's the motivation? That's the first segment. The second part I will talk about you know, our own IEEE Bangalore section's HTC journey so far and what's the plan. And then fusing the two, we'll talk in details about SDG 12, the definition, the matrix, and some of the best cases 
uh, that people are doing some best practices. And then some opportunities, challenges that you could take it up and think for your projects. And this, this is not an uh, specific items that I could give because that's for you to take it up, but some indications as to where the holes are and would you like to tap and what interests you. So with that, let me start with the first segment, which is on the SDG 12. So I will give you the background of this UN Sustainable Development Goals. As you know, the United Nations has been having many different branches. They talk about lever, they talk about telecom, they talk about meteorology, aeronautical, many things. So two such streams have been also on the human development and a separate track has been sustainable development. As you can see the blue and the green track. If you go back to a history a bit of it, the top track, human development. In 1967, this OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And they have this Development Assistance Committee that got formed. That's the start of it. And from there, a few years down the road, there is an UNDP Development Program, United Nations Development Program that got established. Subsequently, not going into all parts of the history, but you know, the definition comes, different countries have come forward, like as you see in 74, Japan came forward. So Japanese International Cooperation Agency is founded. And subsequently you can see France has come and Korea has come forward. Many of those have been talking about how to take this human development. Now, this was meant for poorer countries, the developing countries, and how do you bring them into the fold of the globe? Because on one hand, developed countries are moving forward, but we need to fund them, their programs. And therefore, this UNDP looked into a lot of uh, nations and individuals who could afford such funding, who are willing to give the funding. And so one part is the fund agency. How do you collect funds? The second part have been, what are the priority items on human development? Which countries, which item, poverty, hunger, education, what do you take it up? So that's the second part of it. And the third part of it is, now that you know that these are your programs and this much money is there, which country, which program do you fund? And there are bodies that looked into that. So as you come forward in that journey through different countries, as I said, we reached to 2011, where some kind of processes were set. And so far people have been monitoring those projects. If I come below the green line, in 72, there is a Stockholm Declaration. This was for environments, right? How do you look into, there are so many floods and earthquakes and things like that. So UN also formed in 72, another agency called UNEP, Environment Program. UN Environment Program, like UNDP Development Program, this is Environment Program. And they created a charter and 20 years down the road, 72 to 92, after that, they made it, it even more serious and saw that they need to define more metrics. So this is called Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. So Rio de Janeiro, that's where things happened. And they made a program which is called Rio Plus 20. And as you see, 1992 to 2002 and 2002 to 2012, there was an intermediate meeting in Johannesburg for sustainable development. And what is the future that we want and how has been the outcome so far in 20 years? Now at this juncture, as you can see, the blue and green are coming together. People thought that so far the idea was we take care, we meaning humans take care of the poor and inclusiveness and that part of the game. 
and the environment is in God's hand and Almighty's hand and nature, God's fury, nature's fury. So therefore, if something goes wrong, we always have told it's God's wish, right? However, as the economic activity grew, and as we understand, definitely many things are not in our control, but then there are things that are in our control. And then we are making activities that are starting to hamper the economies and uh, at the same time, the environment together. So this is a point 2015, people started talking about a development agenda. And these SDGs came forward and there was in 12, they made this 10 year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production is a 10 year program. But at this juncture of 15, not just on this sustainable consumption and production, but many other topics that came up and it became a complete development agenda. It was there before, as you can see, even in 92, they defined agenda 21, but now it's much more consolidated, much more together of human development and, and the environments. And as you can see next, this is where we define these goals, right? And there are 17 such goals. And this agenda is defined as 2030. You can see in the picture five key dimensions. First is people, because that came from the top. End poverty, hunger in all forms. Can you bring dignity and equality and so basic living as people as people? not just other animals. Even we are thinking of how to take care of other animals, but at that juncture, it was more about people's dignity and equality. Then obviously we have to grow and that's an economic prosperity. How do you fulfill lives? But the clauses that is coming in harmony with nature, in harmony with nature is kind of an additions. Can we bring some synchronicity? And this is where a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is so far it was two different streams and now we combine. But can we do it together? So far it was a trade off that if we do economic activity, it must mean some environmental degradation. But the paradigm shift is all about can we do and not or this or that, right? Can we do together? It means more thinking, more innovations, but can we do together? So, uh, as we talk about people and prosperity, left side is also about planet. So protect our planet's natural resources. Be cognizant about climate and future generations. We are not here to live our generation alone. We have our kids and kids' kids and grandfather, you know, would love to take care, not just by loving, but truly meaning and making sure that this planet is a good place to live for generations to come. So basic three core principles, social inclusion, let's bring all people together to a certain extent. Let's have our economic prosperity and growth and business and everything flourish, but also let's take environmental protection as a strong agenda. So this is an holistic approach. And as you can see, it's a very fundamental mind shift, paradigm shift to get into this. With that, they defined 17 sustainable goals. And you can see that there are basics like SDG 1. When I say SDG, that's Sustainable Development Goals. And these are numbers 1 to 17. SDG 1 and 2 is really basic. No poverty, zero hunger. Then, for example, 5 and 10, if you take, it's about equality. Gender equality we are promoting now but it's even beyond gender equality and a couple of, let's say a couple of decades later, this may not be a big issue, but then still we might have other kind of inequalities between countries, regions, geographies. And so can we take care? We take care of our health and well-being, and we see uh, three, right? Basic educations. Then we come to seven and 13, which is climate clean energy, so that not just we do it, but we do it clean way. We take care of uh, life below water, on land, 
everywhere and how do you do that right and then I continue to do SDG 8 is talking about work and economic growth we need to have it we need to have industry infrastructure innovations that SDG 9 and 16 17 is really partnerships piece that I mentioned before beyond those three things there were partnerships because to deal with this bigger problem it's not alone even one country doesn't do and participate it's one earth at the end we might say so many countries so many regions but at the end is one earth and it gets affected by our activities any part of the world so how do you bring partnerships and how do you favor the peace and justice but today we are talking about SDG 12 in particular, as you can see in the right, responsible consumption and productions. But by now, I'm sure you have understood why the sustainable development goals have been made, how it has evolved, what are those 17 goals, and we will be talking about 12 here. So with that, I come to the segment two, which is what is IEEE Bangalore section is doing and uh, these technology conferences. So in 2020, we started, and Dr. Puneet he started when he was chair, he took the initiative to have this conference and K. Vijay Raghavan was being then PSA, uh, scientific principal, scientific advisor to government, he joined uh, S.N. Singh is the IEEE India Council Chair, so they all participated in 20 event, even though we meant it to be in North Karnataka physically, but with COVID, obviously it had to be turned to an online program, but great set of speakers, and this was a time when we talk about broadly many goals that I touched upon. As you can see below, the goals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 11 to 15, all were talked about to a certain extent. With this, I think uh, we took an initiative because there is a Region 10 conference, because our Bangalore section falls under Region 10, and they do a humanitarian technology conference in various parts of this Region 10, different countries. And we bid that with the success of the first event, we did this uh, 2021 versions. Again, it was with all those um, SDG in a broader sense. Uh, it was in hybrid mode. Uh, again, the intent was to make it full physical, but being from many other countries, so it was a hybrid event. But by this time, I think a couple of things we realized, and in 2021 bylaws, of IEEE Bangalore section, it has been included that we will have this humanitarian technology conference in one way or the other because this is a need of the hour. And at the same time, enough conference uh, and covered all of the dimensions in a broader sense. So when this year we talked about how to take this forward and physicals, we kind of making it again hybrid, but one day physical, one day virtual mix of it hybrid so that's a separate discussions but i think the next point as you can see uh, we have launched this website sometime back and we have now decided to choose a specific sdg and this time is responsible production and consumption as you can see below it is focusing on sustainable management and use of natural resource Responsible management of chemicals, food waste, other kind of waste generation. Can you reduce, manage? And how do you encourage companies to adopt such practices and report it irrespective of how things are happening? So this will be in that sense a second editions and NIAS, National Institute of Advanced Studies. That's our venue inside the IAC complex. We'd love to see you first and second of December uh, with more active participations and I will come to that. And also taking it forward, I put here BHTC 2023, we have announced and parallelly a separate stream is acting. We have decided that uh, we have three subsections uh, beyond Bangalore sections, the Mysuru, the 
North Karnataka and Mangalore. And this conference will go around in four places and every four years it will be rotated into different places. So we have announced this for uh, Mysore. It will be in NIEIT in uh, March. We have also changed the time to balance our overall events in IEEE uh, to take this forward. And if this year's theme is SDG 12, next year we are doing SDG 3, good health and well-being. And I'm sure we'll have a separate sessions on that. But in the meantime, the call for papers are there and the websites for both of the events are available. So please avail uh, the advantage of that. With that, you have understood where we stand in IEEE Bangalore sections and how we are conducting this event. Now let me come to SDG 12 in particular, the definition, the metrics and good practices. So this is a logo I just wanted to highlight again. Uh, there are different logos of United Nations. This is in particular for 12. You can go the sources in every places I have referred. So all the materials that we have taken from the websites and other places, I have acknowledged them heartily and you can go through them in your leisure time. As you can see on the right side, there are various ways that you can do of the different SDGs, but are we moving away? Are we progressing? Uh, this kind of metric are very, very important. So what's the significance? What are the advantages? What are the dependencies across these SDGs? What are the challenges? How can we mitigate and solve these problems is the later part of the discussion. So as you can see, the sustainable consumption and production, it's a conceptual framework that has been developed. And since it is circular, I'm sure we can start from any place, but let me start maybe from top sustainable resource management, right? Anything that we produce, there is some raw material, some inputs that are required. Now, so far we have been absorbing them and building it, right? We don't have this thought of an alternative way of looking at it. Is this available in abundance? What we are taking, if it is a lithium ion battery that we are using it, everybody is using globally. Now, are you going to run just this generation, would there be enough silicon, lithium ion, or do we need to explore other alternative products? Is it the most optimum product, right? So there is this resource management. Are we taking at the right amount to build something? Then comes design for sustainability. Now you all know different framework. You know, we are all engineers and you talk about design for verifiability, design for testability, design for manufacturability. But this is a concept that we need to bring up front that sustainability is an important part. It's not just enough to think how I produce something or how I test something. It's a very short term goals. So we are good at that, but can we stretch that idea and build it D for S design for sustainability? clean our productions and resource efficiency. When you produce something, maybe it is optimal, but what is the byproduct that it is generating? Is the byproduct harmful? Can you use those byproduct in another way? Is there a cleaner way of doing things? That's the question. But also associated question is resource efficiency, meaning there is leakage. We have seen in many places, you know, power generations to distributions, transmissions, how much power gets lost in the process. So one is for people to, you know, use it and use it nicely. But the other is a loss and that's more serious because had it not been a loss, somebody would have used it or you would have produced less or, right? So resource efficiency, sustainable transport. Are we making one parts in one part of the country and another elements in another part of the country and we are traversing crisscrossing all over country to build a product or do you have an ecosystem a cluster that we are thinking of cluster innovations is close by to produce one thing maybe available 
and then efficient roads what kind of uh, vehicles are these how many years it's aging what fuel it is using so distance fuel aging of the vehicles all matters in that sustainable transport this work a lot of people and I, I again encourage you to hear me out clearly because with this problem statement with this theme as i explain something might interest you and you might say oh that's a problem that i would love to solve but i have a great idea around this can i build around this right so eco leveling and certification so we would love to have a label you know an ecosystem that you build a product and do you put a star do you know how much consumption do you metric do you have a process of certification two star three star and then we say okay this fridge is three star this fridge is four star and what's the difference between those and if we count 20 years of lifespan of a product then how much is the overall systemic difference so that way I can go on in sustainability for procurement, in marketing, in the overall life cycles. But the last part is very important, the waste management. Because at the end, everything has a life cycle, right? And everything has a lifespan, 10 years, 20 years, you know, even your depreciation that we, when you compute, we say, oh, well, this product has a five-year lifespan. This has 10, this has 20, right? So at the end, you it will be a waste from that angle. It may be, maybe it is you before that itself, you could pass it on. When the smartphones came, we bought new things, but we could have given it to the somebody else that your acquaintance is, somebody working in your home, that you could pass it on, right? But that's also getting saturated. So that's one way of using, right? Passing it on. You might have a in a phone some components may be defective so can you refurbish and reuse right after that somebody can do it can you repurpose we have in samsung we have done a galaxy upcycling program in which we can use the phone from one purpose we can make it a locked and maybe you can do a crib monitoring for baby or a surveillance monitor, just a dedicated application, and you freeze that because there is processing power. So instead of throwing it out, you can make a secondary product. So this whole part that you can see on the right side, once you have design and manufacture, it goes to retail, and then consumer household is using. But the important part is reuse, repair, recycle, some components even if it's not fully usable can i pass it on and use those components right maybe they are usable at the end maybe something we have exhausted and it's not possible anymore uh, then the question comes of how are you disposing of the waste what are the treatment plans what are the places that we are disposing so this is all about uh, sustainable consumption productions and a circular economy concept. So at this juncture, I again want uh, everybody to know that our program on 1st and 2nd October, 1st October, we have made specific plans beyond inaugural sessions, a sustainable production session, a sustainable consumption sessions. There will be keynotes and there will be panel discussions but also interactions between the two. There is a specific session that I would be championing along with others is the circular economy. This factor of reuse, repair, recycle, uh, and this whole refurbishment and waste management. So that's one day, but second day when you come, there are projects and programs and Gandhian thoughts of uh, this whole circular economy that will be discussed on 2nd October, which is again happens to be Gandhi Jayanti and many uh, programs of uh, demos and student projects would also be available on those days. So with that, let me go down to some of these ideas of SDG 12, where it is written, because as I said, if you 
if you want to do well, then you have to set targets, you have to have metrics and indicators, right? If you cannot measure, you cannot improve. This is a good saying. So first of all, environmental monitoring, sorry, I'm in the second slide, let me go to the first, which is a sustainable lifestyles, the 10 year framework that I talked about, this has become mainstreamed and all the production patterns, the action items, which country is doing what, this is at a macro level, how people are thinking. But when you come to next level, natural resource management, we want to have an efficient use of natural resource, but how? There is a lot of detailed metrics, but material footprint to build a product for a purpose. If I want to build a paper weight, what's the paper weight? Weight has to be there to do the job. Are we using more materials than it's required? So overall, for many things, people would look into it for a purpose. If you build a building, how much steel are you using? So per capita, per GDP, this is at a country level, but even we can bring it down and say, what are we using it for? Domestic material consumptions. We know we talk about electricity consumptions, but it can be anything, right? Whatever we are using in a daily basis, the electricity is a good example, but per capita, per GDP. And this also helps such metrics because we know there is a disparity between developed countries and developing countries. Developed countries are using because the resources are abundant and available today. So this per capita, per GDP might be very high. So we are a large nation with many populations. So when you aggregate, maybe it is high, but maybe our per capita, per GDP is not that high. So this brings a checks and balance across countries also, right? Um, how is the living standard and what is happening? But more coming down to our level of things where we can have more control is, for example, food waste. When you look into data, I just did that from farm to fork, as we call it, like agri produce, if I take what's produced in the farm and when I take it to fork me in my dining table, how much is loss? This loss index is bothering everybody and it seems to be at different levels. Overall, 30% food loss is happening in different things. Some are in the productions, some are in the consumptions. And that's where it plays an important role, production and consumption. So can we monitor in the production level, in the supply chain and carrying and post harvest losses, as well as the wastage that we do when there is a buffet or other things, uh, there is a lot of waste. Same way, I'll not go into very details, but you can see chemical management. This is an important one. And partly education plays a role right? Because nobody has measured. If you ask a farmer, if they are putting a pesticide and fertilizers, they're meaning well, right? They want to make better products and they should be able to sell. People should be happy eating, but they don't know what's the right amount of fertilizer and pesticide. So what's happening? What's the neat result of that? They are spending more money because they might be putting more and it is coming through the food into our bodies. So it's a toxicity. And its soil also gets eroded because there is this effect of, on the soil, right? If you do more fertilizer, you can see after four or five uh, food productions of a particular crop, you are not able to have any crop for a couple of years before you replenish, right, the soil. So therefore, I think it's very important that we start monitoring and getting data from globals that what is an optimum level of this fertilizer, chemicals and everything, right? So that's, I give an example of um, in the context of agri-produce, but even in other contexts, there is a lot of waste. Waste management itself is a topic, but hazardous waste is even more and therefore it will be measured separately. Hazardous waste generated per capita. What kind of treatment do you bring in, right? So this waste management is an important. 
Same way you continue to see many more metrics. So let me bring some key points. One thing that people are saying, all the corporates must produce, monitor and produce reports, a sustainability report. Good, bad, ugly is a later part, but please produce a sustainability information as we produce our business reports every quarter or so half yearly, but definitely in the reporting cycles we need to bring in. And how are you procuring all those green public procurement, green transmission, so measurements around that. But as I said, important thing is a broad awareness, data, information, and spread of that citizenship education uh, to be able to do. Because many of the things people are doing, uh, knowing but for business profit they're doing. Sometimes it's agreed, sometimes maybe a need, but sometimes maybe ignorance, right? Because they don't know. So therefore, I'm just doing my best based on my knowledge. So more knowledge we could create around this and disseminate, well, I think a lot of problems could be solved. And there is research development and innovations around that. As you can see on those fossil fuels and many other things, but one important point that SDG 12 has brought in, and it can be interesting for some of you, is sustainable tourism. This is a specific item. It may look like it's part of the whole thing, but you know, just think of a place like Goa, you know, beach. You now we might go one day in a year to enjoy and have foods and plastics and all kinds of things because you are going for fun and you have been always restraining and therefore it outbursts. But think of the poor beach or the city of Goa, you know, every day so many visitors and it will be polluted, not just one day, but day after days. Therefore, that's just as an example to bring it, but more important point is, how do you make sure that tourism, and I, in fact, a lot of people go for recreations and therefore, instead of wasting into this way, I think, you know, the cycling and many other trek routes and people can create things and bring new ideas so that the tourism become much more sustainable. So I hope with this detailed explanations, you have got what this SDG 12 is. And if you have still not got, let me give you some examples, very brief. People are thinking about art mall, like Rakuten, give an example. Can you bring all the shopping that changes the future, the clean product? This morning, I attended a pitch sessions by one clean beauty company startup and who is saying beauty products are important that in any case is growing, but can I have clean beauty? But people don't know again, all the beauty products, which one is clean and which one is not. What are the metrics? How do you measure? Uh, therefore, can you have such malls? And I was happy to see that uh, this morning, but then there is organic farming. There are villages examples, uh, one of planet network that is measuring reporting and specifically United Nations also recognize that some days may have to be promoted, even if it's for a few years, once the problem goes like, for example, ozone layer, when it was getting depleted and this is kind of protecting us rights from the direct cosmic rays. And so they define international day for the preservation of the ozone layer because it helps us. And chlorofluorocarbon from the fridge and many other places was actually causing the harm. So therefore, can you uh, make this day celebrated for a purpose and hopefully problems go away. So these are some examples. Let me finish this segment by one more things of a case study from Japan. This is my third segment and uh, let me take this example of it. So sometimes it is theory, right? Many of the ideas people can do it, people might do it in piecemeal and therefore you might see some results but may not see always a very holistic results. Therefore this Kitakyushi city in Japan they decided to control and have many such programs 
in a focused fashion in one place so that people can see what needs to happen and does it work. So for example, the first part is clean up productions but pollution management. Look at the things. How do you do product design? How do you make those process and manufacturing process? If you have produced some byproducts, as you can see on the left side, can you utilize those byproducts into another? Because you created, so now not so clean, but can you use it? Can you use unused energy in some other ways? So therefore you are pollutant reduction, energy saving, resource recovery. So already there is a goal set. And they call end of pipe. Whatever you do, there would be at the end of pipe something not so great. There is wastewater, but can you treat? Desulfurization system, right? Electric precipitation machines. So do the process clean, but end of pipe, whatever is there, can you even clean it up? Energy management, the whole city, what are the ways are you energy generating energy? What's the solar, wind and others? Smart community creation project, can you even share in the grid from one to the other? so that you optimally generate and whole of these are getting used and the transmission loss is less and it is cost effective solution. So environmentally urban development of a district that they target. You see first and largest project of facilitating resource circulation in eco industries. So they took automobile, office equipment, home appliances, all of those and can we create an eco town? And the last part, through the public-private partnerships, they looked into, which is a water business. So can I have a water plaza? And on one hand, the sewage systems, treatment of the sewage through membranes and others, but also the seawater desalinations, because if you want to get, they have the sea coast, and therefore, can you use membranes to desalinate and use the seawater for things? and have the treatment plan. So how does this whole thing works? The advanced desalination systems, can you integrate? What kind of membranes could come? So it's a very scientific way of building products, of testing it, deploying it, seeing it, and say, if it can work in one place, it can work in many places, right? This is the whole idea. And I hope with this, you have got the essence of SDG 12, uh, various items, the metrics and parameters, and how we can deploy it. Now, these are bigger systems, so let me come to my fourth and the last segments. And this is where, if you have not yet got ideas, please listen to me for this segment with the three slides, which will talk about some of these challenges and opportunities and what might click for you to build an idea, build a solutions, propose something new. And it's not just SDG 12. Some of these SDGs are also interconnected, right? So that's why I'm saying in and around SDG 12, just to explain the point very clearly. So SDG 12 is responsible production and consumer, right? Our consumptions. Now, for example, SDG 4, where we talk about education, right? So there, as you see in this table, 12.a can be having a map onto 4.7. If you go into the details, 4.7 is talking about strength and scientific and technological capacity, but that is for anything and everything, not just for environment. But if I couple environment or this responsible production consumptions along with that educations, then we can have it. So same way, sustainable development 15 is about life on land. If you go back to that chart, you'll see life on land. And how do you manage natural resources? Uh, 11 is sustainable cities and communities. So how do you reduce food waste? So you can go there, health quality, that's SDG 3. So how strong is the linkage between two how do you support the completion of one versus the other? How does SDG 12 foster healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages? 
So not the whole of the SDGs, but a part of SDG may have a linkage to SDG 12. So if you are submitting an idea and it's on the borderline health or other things, please see how they are associated and it can still fall under SDG 12 plus the Delta, but you can fit that. So this slide and the next slide is just going to give you two views. I borrowed this slide. So as you can see, again, let's bring the ideas. Alternative resources, because we have been doing lithium ion or silicon and that's one way, but it doesn't have to be that way. So can we have our thought process of our progress decoupled with the resources? challenge ourselves with the alternative finding if one resource is not very suitable, polluting, like we have seen coal, fine, it has served its purpose, it will continue to do so, but can I find, I need energy, so I'm not compromising for my progress, I need electricity, but instead of fossil fuels, can I go into this wind energy and biomass, biofuel and at the same time of the solar energy, which is uh, plenty available here. So you don't compromise on your goal, but you change the thought process. And this is where I think um, a lot of mindset change comes. Life quality and health. If we can promote to have a good health, good food, less fertilizer, chemicals, you optimize, but you also improve life quality and health. You optimize your cost. So it is not always necessary that doing better means more expensive. In fact, could be less expensive because we didn't have data. We didn't have a way to look into it. So financial savings is an important part. Now, some cases we might have to put up front, but uh, over 20 years time, you might be paying off much better. The solar is a great example that you might have to pay something up front but at the end, it pays off. There is no additional cost in your OPEX. But as you can see, you know, you will monitor the carbon emissions and preserve the natural resources. The end goal is the environment preservation. But you have to have measurements, metrics. Remember, I said material footprint reduction. Everything that we are building, footprint per capita, per product, per something, let's measure, are you using too much? And then behavioral change is an absolute necessity, uh, coupled with knowledge and education. If I knew there is an alternative way of doing things, sometimes you have to force like single plastic usage ban, right? It's for a purpose that if you are having multiple usage, maybe it is still fine, we don't have so many alternatives, but single usage, can we try to do? The jute bag has been a great example of that. And we'll talk about many such examples in the forum, and I would love to encourage you to again join actively uh, to bring your ideas, but at the same time, even if you don't have ideas, at least join the event and educate yourself. And um, once you are educated, people around you, you can pass it on. And I think there will be a societal change in terms of our behavior in terms of our consumption patterns and the mindset. So with that, I come to this as a last slide, which again brings up a little bit more. I think the previous cut and this cut, little difference, but you wanted to put it another angle to in your mind. And this angle, like first one, as you can see, see we have been obsessed with products because we needed a better, bigger, you know, even smartphone context, I'm coming back from Samsung. So we've seen that small phones, let's get bigger. And there was a vanity quotient with that and foldables and everything. That's one part of it that I need to change every 18 months, my device. But fine, I mean, everything has a period. We are not blaming, but today consumption of experience are being more valued. It's not the product. So I can have same product, but my gaming, my metaversical experience or gaming experience or education and health and many things that we can measure and my wearables for health quality measurements. 
So there is an experience factor, so consumptions, we might be liking to consume as human being. Can we divert from the products and the raw materials to experience consumptions? This is an important part. And then as you can see, where to invest, uh, information on the behavioral change, the policy making that is happening, number five, which I would highlight again, concepts of circular economy and sustainable value chains. Shorten the transportation period, have a great vehicles, um, you know, all of those, but also at the end, a product with a lifespan of 10 years, if not for you, for somebody else, can it be used for 20 years? Uh, can there be a repurposing of the device to do it? One other thing that people are highlighting, as you can see in six and nine, is to also think about local context. Because when a product is globally made, and for a local purpose, it may be not fully used. So actually on you not using the full power of that device locally, you're using partly paying higher, but using partly. And then you are buying three other products because you might have three other needs. So can there be one product, maybe if that's local needs, combining them. And this can spark the product innovations, as you can see in six coupled with local wisdom and indigenous knowledge, like India, like country with Adivasis. And there is a lot of knowledge that has been there for generations and generations. It's not just a few generations and not this literature. So can you use them in truth is they have lived their life in one way. Maybe they didn't have the alternatives, but now that we have alternatives, doesn't mean we have to use it. We can keep those for some purposes, but can we use whenever it is possible that uh, wisdom of uh, indigenous knowledge, right? And then going into the IoT and AI, newer technologies that have come, automations can help your home, you know, uh, tariff reductions, uh, optimizations of power consumptions. So all this is possible, uh, whether it is smart home, smart building, urban planning, smart cities, and all of those places that we should be able to use it. But at the end, uh, to sum it up, you know, it is a multi-stakeholder partnerships. Therefore, partnerships is an important point and all countries need to keep talking. This kind of United Nations bodies as well as separate regional bodies have uh, popped up and they uh, can also learn from these, keep sharing. Let's not worry about, you know, whether you are two star versus somebody's five star, uh, because you need to first measure and then people should accommodate and developed countries have also realized that developing countries need to progress. And so they may need a bit more time and few things. So such alliances are also coming in some of the goals that we have seen in Paris Treaty, what is set for some of the countries at 2050, for some at 2060, for others at 2070, because it's a balancing act between our economic activity and progress as a nation, and at the same time, um, you know, taking care of environment. We have seen good result, uh, you know, during pandemic lockdown time, how weather and, you know, climate has been clean. So nature knows how to take care with or without us. Question is, you know, as we enjoy and have this human centric, lots of benefits. If we can take care, then I think we coexist with the nature. Otherwise, I think nature knows how to survive. Uh, we need to learn how we survive and thrive in this context. So we, this, I again uh, encourage you. Thank you all. I'm heartily acknowledging all materials that I've taken from the internet side, providing credit to sources. Some is under CCBY SA license, which is very generous, meaning you can take it, use it, uh, which I've taken at Dito and uh, acknowledging them. And I'm also happy to place this presentation with the new information in the public domain, along with this video as an IEEE Bangalore section uh, item to take this forward in the similar conditions.
Uh, with this, I thank you again and welcome you for your active participation in this SDG 12 journey, uh, 1st and 2nd October. But I think 21st of this month is our date for the submissions of proposals. You have about two weeks and uh, think about it. It doesn't have to be pretty big, but joining, participating, ideating along with us will take us forward and we can, uh, if you have a great idea, as we can see what next to do uh, with our mentorships and other things. I'm sure there are other good news. I would at this point stop it, hand it over to Dr. Bindu Thomas to see if there are announcements and followed by Chengappa. I thank you again for certain materials that you have provided and recording and all the infrastructural supports uh, on this. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, comments, I'll be happy to take it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would uh, request the participants to share or, you know, put forward your questions, uh, maybe in the chat box. As we don't see any questions, uh, I think I will just uh, share, meanwhile, uh, the, the plan that we have in place for the project and uh, the poster presentation competitions to be held on the 2nd of October as a part of the BHTC. Uh, so what was very important and the key aspect here was, are we all aware of what is SDG 12? And that's why this curtain raiser webinar was in place. And I thank sir for, you know, giving end to end understanding. Thank you so much, sir. You have touched upon all the possibilities. I think with the students, will get, uh, you know, a very good understanding about which are the areas that they can uh, present either as a form of an idea or as a project itself. So this is, um, it was very useful. And as we initially started off, this recording will be available, uh, which will be used by, uh, I mean, which can be used by all the interested students and uh, it will be circulated rather. Uh, so that is uh, very uh, beneficial. Uh, so thank you so much, sir, that you touched upon almost every aspect in SDG 12 and in general about the UN uh, SDGs, which I, I'm sure many of our students uh, will not be really aware about. Uh, in fact, it was a very great learning when I sat through the entire uh, presentation of yours, sir. Thank you. Uh, so can I still uh, hope that uh, anybody wants to interact with, sir, because uh, such a simple and... <laughs> you know, wonderful presentation that you gave. I think people should take this opportunity to interact with you. Mm. Anybody okay. coming up? We have yeah. a question on the chat. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, sir. I think that was Jay Krishna, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Jay Krishnan. Uh, 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 hello, it was a interesting presentation. Uh, in fact, no, the last couple of slides, no, you threw open, you know, lot of areas for us to reflect upon. Uh, but one question I just wanted to ask, two questions, quick questions. The first question is, uh, basically, you know, IEEE is in the forefront of all the technologies that we are talking about. And uh, in our country, in the next uh, decade, there is going to be a lot of electronic waste going to be generated. So uh, how IEEE can influence uh, policy making at, you know, uh, at the central level and things like that? Uh, where uh, we can bring in modularity uh, with respect to the products like, you know, smartphones, then, you know, tablets and things like that. Like the recent European Union legislation standardized on various things so that people don't throw out, you know, things whenever some new model comes and things like that. So based on your experience with uh, Samsung and your, you know, uh, involvement in IEEE, how do you think, you know, IEEE can get involved in the, at the policy level in our country? Uh, to make, you know, things more modular so that the electronic waste that gets generated, you know, gets minimized in this country. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question. And uh, I think you are very knowledgeable. I, I really see many things, you know, on this whole sustainability programs in your own work and otherwise. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, See, again, I think uh, as an IEEE, globally, they are giving emphasis. We recently met the IEEE COO uh, a couple of days back, and he also highlighted this whole journey of sustainability would be a big item 
globally. And uh, when the president-elect visits in December, he would again emphasize. So first is on the IEEE part that that emphasis on is this an important topic? I mean, is it just an topic on the sideline or is it a mainstream? So I do see that globally this is becoming a mainstream. So that's number one. Number two, as a center here, we have taken this step and that's why I showed very clearly those events that we are doing now. Currently it is an event and two years have passed by in the lockdown mode as you all know. Therefore, now is the time and this is where we highlighted and taking a specific SDGs of 12 and 3 for the next years. So that's second as a commitment and we have put in the bylaws that this is an important charter uh, so that, you know, all of us subscribe to that. So that's the second. Uh, coming to your point of Samsung, I gave a little touchdown point of Galaxy upcycling. We take it very seriously. We have partnered in Samsung in the sustainable development goals with the UN. And since you asked the question, I would be very happy to say that on the health SDG 3, but also the knowledge which is coupling with this. Um, we have initiated, for example, a eye checking method and we have partnered with Arvind Eye Care and many others, three different clinic centers, whereby people are coming very quick checks on the eye and other fronts good, bad, and, you know, catter or other kind of problems because early detection itself can solve that problem very well. So therefore, that's a thing there. What I said about galaxy upcycling is one way to reduce the waste. We have a couple of programs there with some uh, companies in India, and they are actually serving us globally also, not just in India. We have taken them to global. And they are doing a Galaxy Care Plus. Do you know when something goes wrong? Because today in the inside the smartphones, there are many sensors. So I know what has dropped, what is not working, working. So the internals of the device is also well understood from outside by monitoring uh, different parameters. And therefore we know something is functional. Can it be refurbished? Can it be not? Now, who is the customer is another, but there is a lot of like Cashify kind of companies and many others who are generating these and taking care of the product so that, you know, it goes to the right second level, third level with a, a refurbished model. Sometimes they call it super refurbished and things like that so that people also get confidence that I can use it. Now, what we have also done is this. Uh, product, we have also used it for various things. I touched upon it. Can I use it as a camera? Because there is a camera. Can I use it for surveillance and use the processing power? And I don't do it because it's a Note 5 products, let's say, uh, older product. I don't want to use it, but I can do it for these purposes. So there are many such examples, products, solutions of baby monitoring, crib monitoring, and other things, sound uh, generations are there. Now, the last part of this, which is combining, let's say, Samsung kind of work and IEEE and your policy making part on the waste management. This is a bigger things. And there are some companies, each of the corporates are tying up with the people who can dispose it off if it is not usable. And they have their own treatment plants and other, which we have certain knowledge. But I'm sure, you know, we, we can take this. We have our site, we have many such programs. I mean, you are part of that move things that you mentioned. So in a broader sense, if we look into all the sustainability or humanitarian components, I think we need to form some kind of teams. And I'm hoping that beyond this event or during that time, we can talk more, generate and see um, after listening to many experts and possibly take up one or two items and uh, government is quite willing. We have many channels open, but we need to know what to propose to government to do it. And if it means going along with some of the startups, uh, we'll be happy to do that. But there is a job in hand to identify and take it. So that's my answer for now. I don't think it's answers fully as a concrete step, but the intent has been there. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was. Uh... 
uh, good, you know, uh, it gives a lot of things for uh, further discussion. And uh, the next question was with respect to uh, the PhD, uh, what I understand is in academia, a lot of people uh, pursue PhD and I don't see uh, the end uh, uh, dissertation getting, you know, an application in the field. So, do you think uh, this area, SDG 12, uh, especially with respect to the electronics, uh, waste management, and you know, or all the circular economy, that can throw open a lot of PSE, you know, topics for our researchers in this country. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I think definitely it has to be happening. It will happen because it's becoming mainstream more and more. What I see is some of the Sub subsuming some of the thoughts, you know, in terms of they're not direct, but in terms of let's say power consumption. If VLSI, some people are doing low power circuitry, or if it's a Bluetooth, you know, sensors, can it be ultra low energy kind of things, or a protocol that is not always on, even though we want an always on system, but not the whole stack is on, but maybe some parts is on very minuscule part. And once there is an activity, then they will wake it up the rest of the system. So you don't have to consume all the power. Uh, there are many things of this nature, even on the cooling side. I've seen some of the big corporations who are working uh, how to do that. So on the systemic level, one level down, not at the product level and uh, uh, what we are talking about, direct waste management or refurbishment on this part of it is not fully addressed and there is enough room, but how to consume less. Uh, there has been a lot of, um, you know, dissertations that I see. But again, I'm, I'm damn sure, you know, we can grow that. It's, it's never ending and it's going to be mainstream. Yes. We just need to identify equivalent to a PhD topic. That is a job in hand because not every problem is a PhD topic problem. So I think we'll have to think that way. But yes, I am fully with you. Yeah, yeah, because if they result in economic benefit and community, you know, uh, uh, what you call benefit, uh, definitely, you know, those are the type of research, you know, we should uh, encourage. Uh, yeah, basic research is required, but then there are a lot of research, you know, which are more applied to the real problems happening around our country. Uh, I don't see, you know, a clear focus there. So maybe the events like this uh, should have some deliberation basically to um, uh, challenge, you know, researchers and academicians, you know, to start looking at this and, you know, start coming up with, you know, uh, areas where some interesting work can be done. As you are talking, I'm also thinking the temps that is there, you know, the technology management, uh, possibly this cuts across both. I mean, some of the topics, not all of it. Uh, technology and from management, maybe there could be even an opportunity. We'll talk to them and see how we can streamline and invite them during the session. Let's make this event time a little fruitful time and identify some problems. Then I think we can approach different institutes to take from there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ajita sir, for your questions and also uh, Alok sir for uh, answering that and giving perspectives on those names. So there is one question from participant Mr. Ambrish uh, who wants to know uh, how Indian Industrial Revolution and also Industry 4.0 helps in SDG sector in a broader way. Or probably to rephrase this, can Industry 4.0 can be a step towards achieving the SDGs, the UN SDGs? Yeah, if you see my last slide, I mean, when I mentioned this, uh, I think it, it, there was one part of the hint, the seven role of digital technologies, IoT and AI, and that's kind of another way of saying industry 4.0. There are thin AIs, not very heavy, but also the automation part. So automation, obviously, whether it is smart home, building, um, cities, factories, always saves because you know you don't have the break and uh, obviously there is a challenge of human in the loop can solve some ambiguity that's a different kind of problems but wherever there is no ambiguity less ambiguity possibly we can switch over and we can optimize right i mean lesser power consumptions uh, into certain things uh, that is there so uh, definitely it has a goal but it can solve 
on its own way and up to a point. I think the whole idea here is, uh, just to be clear, the technology can bring one thing, but if you look into all these other parts of circular economy, this is a big thing. So IoT is not gonna solve this, and this itself can contribute. Or if we talk about um, you know, productions part of it, or the consumptions part. See, at the end, what is it? This is all about we all people are producers as well as consumers, right? We consume some time and we produce something, assuming you are active member of something, right? We are presumers. The question that is there is that has been always there. We produce, we consume, maybe different things. The responsible part is coming. That's the SDG 12, is the responsible. And when you have played both sides, probably it helps you to gain more responsibility. So I think a fundamentally, lot of data, lot of education, lot of such balancing act of that responsibility, drawing a line that I don't need beyond this. This is good, right? For my purpose. So this I think is the whole angle that SDG 12 is bringing. Obviously many other technologies. So I appreciate and I understand and I hope you got my point that any automation helps, but it is one component of it. And you are free to take up that topic and then build that, uh, but it's much bigger than that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you sir, uh, for uh, sharing those insights. Uh, so looks like there are no more questions. Uh, with this, like I would hand it back to Dr. Bindu uh, Thomas for the closing comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Once again, uh, so as we were discussing uh, before the questions came in, so the one uh, uh, you know few things that I would like to say about the project and the poster uh, competition is uh, generally we are looking at the focused uh, theme, which is SDG 12. As sir explained, uh, the end to end understanding uh, must be in uh, with all of you now, but at the same time, sir also said the correlation between certain SDGs and the border cases and how you can, you know, um, uh, you know, come out with uh, solutions or project ideas, which are nearly going to be uh, the SDGs, right? So that is 1 aspect. Um, so you can actually take that um, at the same time. Um, uh, there is a post presentation competition which will help all of you come up with your or rather share your um, ideas, uh, which generally we look at as students are very, you know, they think out of the box, their ideas are very creative. You may not be able to implement them or demonstrate, but uh, this uh, forum or this project, um, I mean, this opportunity is for those who want to ideate and represent their uh, ideas. Uh, of course, as Sir mentioned, we will have great mentors who would um, help you implement those in the future. Uh, so please feel free to also put forward your ideas in this uh, theme. So uh, with all this, uh, you can, uh, with, uh, within 21st, please try to submit your abstracts, uh, which is uh, within 500 words. That gives us an understanding uh, whether you can come up with your project or posters uh, before the event. And so we will reach out to you. Uh, the one thing that I would like to announce is um, the chair of Bangalore section has announced uh, up to 50,000 as the prize money for this event, which is uh, a huge sum. So I request the participants and the interested participants to come forward and take this opportunity. Uh, so thanks to uh, Deepa Shanai ma'am to be so uh, you know open to support this uh, project and post presentation competition, especially for the students. Right. So, with all this, I would like to also thank uh, the uh, committee members, um, especially Ashok sir. Ashok Das sir is also the key member here. Um, along with uh, our team, we have uh, Professor Raghavendra Prasad, uh, Professor Ravi Hosmani, Professor Ashwini Holla, and myself, and a couple of my colleagues, uh, Professor Komla Kumari and uh, Professor Namrata Dikruz, who have coordinated with uh, all of us uh, in engaging and making sure that a good number of student participants come over and uh, listen to this uh, very, very interesting uh, you know, webinar, which has uh, definitely given a lot of insights 
to our student friends and of course there are a lot of listeners here apart from students uh, so thank you all once again and thanks a big thanks to uh, alok nath sir for uh, taking this uh, you know the webinar to this extent and giving complete clarity uh, for the uh, participants out here thank you once again sir thank you hope to see you there and have nice participations jai hind jai hind thank you we can close the meeting uh, mr chengappa